with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Science Tonight. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for tuning in. I am your host every Thursday, in fact. My name is Chris Smith. Tonight, we've got a great program for you. We've got an exciting guest, an exciting topic, cryptic crayfish. That's right, they're cryptic, not just because they hide in muddy tunnels or are lurking around in streams and creeks, but there's a lot more to crayfish to be uncovered and discovered. And to do that, we've got a very special guest. For the show tonight, I wanna to remind everybody that a little later in the program, we'll be doing audience Q&A. Part of this program every week is that all of you, the viewers, get the chance to ask your questions of our very special guests. So if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, you can use the chat box over there to the side. I, I think it's on that side of the screen. You can use the chat box. You can use the comment thread to post your thoughts, questions, experiences. And a little later in the program, We'll be sharing them with our guest. That way we can all have one big conversation about the oh so important and oh so special little critters we call crayfish or crawdads or crawfish or yabbies or mud bugs and maybe even more work terms for that I'm not familiar with. But you know who does know? Dr. Zach Loafman. Dr. Lofman is the co-graduate program director and the zoo science and applied conservation coordinator at West Liberty University. He is also an expert, at least in my opinion, on all things crayfish. He's described new species. He's written about them. He's read about them quite a lot. And importantly, very importantly, especially to me and my job, is that Zach is also a research affiliate officially with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in the non-molluscan invertebrate unit, which might be the highest title achievable in the realm of science. It's like research affiliate and Nobel. Zach, welcome to the show. Thank you all for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? It's research affiliate, uh, I, I think maybe it's a co-graduate program and then Nobel? I'll, I'll take it. I mean, I don't think I'm ever gonna be at the Nobel level, but hey, Crayfish might get me there one day. So. <laughs> they don't. They don't give Nobels for crayfish ecology. No, they don't. Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna write a letter. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna write a letter about that. Well, Zach, thanks for being here. Uh, since since everybody these days is hanging out in internet land, uh, where are you in real space right now? Uh, I am in northern West Virginia, the northern Panhandle, uh, sandwiched between Pennsylvania and Ohio. And I'm actually sitting in my office at West Liberty University, hence the crayfish in the background. So. Yeah, I was just <laughs> noticing. I'm glad you gave folks uh, something related to look at. Yes. <laughs> and we go, oh, yeah, that's, we can talk about crayfish a little bit. Well, I'm glad to have you on the show. And folks, we're going to dive into science, biology, and ecology of crayfish. But first, we're going to have a little bit of fun. Zach, I've prepared a game for you. I hope you don't mind indulging me. I love games. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, everybody. So we're going to play trivia. Zach, I've got three questions for you. Mm -hmm. Multiple choice. You get two out of the three correct. We'll declare you a winter and enter you into the, uh, the Science Tonight Claw of Fame. Okay. And um, have you heard of the Hickory Crawdads? I have, okay, but I haven't spent much time with them, so or around them. So for all the folks at home, uh, you're a crayfish expert. So I've prepared three trivia questions about the High A minor league baseball affiliate of the Texas Rangers, the Hickory Crawdads. Okay. Here's your first question. When the Hickory Crawdads came to Hickory, North Carolina in 1993, the team owners asked the public to send in names for the new name of the team. Crawdads, of course, was the winner, but which of these was one of the finalists that wasn't chosen? The Woodchucks, the Carpenters, or the Dickory Docks? 
the hickory dickory docks. This what is, do you think, Zach? It's a little tough. T- it's I don't think it's C. I, I you could don't see. Don't think it's the dickory docks. I don't know. Maybe. I'm gonna go. In the chat. What do you think? With the biology route, I mean, you can chuck a baseball. Oh, okay. I, I would. Though Carpenter's is logical, so, but we're gonna go with 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 the fun, more fun of the two options, and I like groundhogs. So, let's hope the people of Hickory did too. A. Eh? Woodchucks. Ding ding ding. All Correct right. answer. Yes. Yes, the woodchucks, of course, didn't win, but that was one of the top contenders. Yeah, uh, folks actually like wrote into the paper, mm-hmm. uh, upset that it wasn't the woodchuck because uh, they thought the wood part of woodchuck referenced Hickory's furniture making. So well, I'm glad they went with crawdads. Right. So. I, I like crawdads. I like crawdads. Okay, next question. What is the name of the Hickory Crawdads crayfish mascot? Oh is my it goodness. Candy, Conrad, or Crazy? I'm going to go with C. You feel confident about that one, don't you? I mean, it is a crayfish. Crazy. Crayfish. Crazy crayfish. No, it's actually B, Conrad. Conrad the Cotter. I'm a scientist that don't, don't write poetry. So. <laughs> <laughs> don't write poetry. Conrad the Crawfish. Uh, yeah, Candy. Candy is actually the name. Just a few years ago, they introduced a crawfish, crayfish mascot with pigtails and a dress. They named that one Candy, but the premier mascot here is Conrad. All right, you're one for one, last chance. No pressure. <laughs> the 2018 Hickory Crawdad season was notable for which oh reason? God. A, the most home runs in, within the last five seasons, B, the most strikeouts within the last eight seasons, or C, the first minor league baseball mascot marriage between Conrad and Candy. <laughs> well for the record i flip a lot of rocks i don't watch that much baseball so um i feel you i feel you there let's go with the marriage i hope that's right candy and conrad were married in the first ever minor league mascot mar- marriage I mean, it's probably an actual sporting, like accompli- athletic accomplishment. Uh huh. But I, I'm sorry, the folks of North Carolina. Um, I, I, I don't know <laughs> anything about the actual, I tell you everything about your mascot, but I don't know much about your team. So I'm sticking with it. That is the correct answer. All right, good. The first minor league mascot marriage. In fact, all three of these were correct. I rigged the game. Oh, okay. In Thank 2018, you. They got the most home runs since 2014, the most strikeouts since 2011. And the easily the most notable thing, the one that was in all the papers was that Conrad and Candy got married. Yep. That's the correct answer. Excellent right, job. Thanks. Two out, of, two out of three, you enter our Science Tonight Claw of Fame that I've just instituted as part of tonight's Tonight's, uh, let's see, how do people in the chat do? Oh, nice, most folks got it right. Most folks got it right. Good job, everybody. So, you know what? Uh, on the heels of that last question, you, you said you could tell us everything about the mascot except uh, information about the game that it plays. So let's, let's actually do a little bit of the science now and tell us a little bit about uh, what you work on and what your lab is up to. All right, I can do that. So when it comes to what I do, uh, this is what I do. So I'm a, what's called an astecologist, uh, and that's the technical term for a crayfish biologist. 
And uh, my role as an astrologist is multifaceted. There aren't many of us. I always tell people crayfish biologists are actually, like we're endangered species. So there's probably a dozen uh, biologists in the country right now that have dedicated their life to crayfish. And when it comes to me and my laboratory, um, I go into the field pretty much all over the Eastern United States. I do most of my work in from South Carolina up through Pennsylvania here on the East Coast. But this picture was a picture of me in Texas with a wonderful crayfish called Phallocambaris devastator. It probably has the most dramatic name of any crayfish you know, on planet Earth. Uh, but, you know, my students and I are uh, run the West Liberty University Crayfish Conservation Lab. And so you know, we go out after animals. Here I am again in Texas. Those are all mud bug burrows in the background there. And we basically document the biology of these animals. And when we do that, we're always making discoveries. It's a ton of fun. Uh, and we do this in the hopes of teaching people. So here I am teaching uh, a bunch of fish and wildlife biologists how to collect crayfish in the field. Um, and the goal is to kind of foster an appreciation ultimately with the lab for these animals. And as you'll find out, as a scientist, they're a perfect study subject because we know so little about them that pretty much anything you do ultimately proves to be important. So I can't do this alone. Uh, I have a ton of help and here are my helpers. Uh, they earned their ice cream on this day. This was in South Carolina after we had gone looking for crayfish that hadn't been found in forever. Uh, the guy in the purple shirt um, didn't really like his ice cream cone. He handed that off to someone else. But uh, for the most part, you know, <laughs> we have a ton of fun. And the ultimate goal of what we're doing is to generate facts, which then we hand off to uh, conservation managers. And then they utilize that information that we generate to come up with conservation plans um, for crayfish. So we don't just run around in the field, uh, you know, chasing crayfish. We also dress up every now and then and head to conferences. So here we are doing that um, and present our data there as well. So we don't just catch the crayfish. We're also preaching the gospel of crayfish and trying to make as many people aware of these animals as possible. And then just as an aside, you know, it's a little bit strange for a biologist to show a picture like this, but the most common question that I get, and maybe I can answer it ahead of time, um, is do you eat crayfish? And the short answer to that is yes. Yes, I do. Uh, Cajun food is actually you eat a whole plate of them. In fact, yes. This was after um, we were presenting at a, a conference in uh, Mobile, Alabama. So I always tell people it's a good thing I don't study pandas. So there you go. Oh goodness! <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, fascinating stuff. So okay, so the lab is out there looking for crayfish, writing up about crayfish, but. For me, mostly, and maybe the folks at home watching too, what is a crayfish? Like, what are the what's crayfish 101 stuff that everybody should know about them? So, uh, crayfish are small, what we call decapod crustaceans. So, uh, the subphylum crustacea involves a tremendous amount of uh, diversity within a group of animals we call arthropods, and the decapods are. I always say the, the species of crustaceans that we eat, um, they're, they're the large economically important species. And with these animals, uh, they because they're so large, oftentimes they fill a role in an ecosystem that's kind of equivalent to what vertebrates would be doing. So that's what makes them a lot of fun to study. Uh, and so in our streams where these animals live, they do all kinds of cool things. They're what we call an ecosystem engineer. So they manipulate the stream bed and they create habitat. And through the creation of burrows and things like that underneath rocks, they provide places for uh, darters and salamander larvae and, and even large salamanders to live. So they're creating homes for animals. Uh, and then the other thing that they represent is they're an absolutely critical part of any food web they're a part of. So they eat a lot of things and then a lot of things eat them. And so in, in them filling that role or niche, uh, they're real important in the transfer of energy. Uh, and I'm going to cut myself off there because I can preach the gospel of crayfish for about the next 12 hours with that question. So, you know, that, that's where I'm going to end it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so a follow up then. Uh, you talked about them being ecosystem engineers. So they're yeah. 
is this, are they building like little rock hovels? Uh, you mentioned burrows, but are, do different species of crayfish in different places uh, burrow or make, I've seen um, these like in, inside our museum, right? We have a model of a crayfish mm -hmm. burrow, but it's this like mound of mud and it's a tunnel that goes down. Is that the same thing as crayfish in the water? How do they go about all of this? Yeah. So there's uh, terrestrial crayfish, and then there's uh, aquatic crayfish, semi-aquatic crayfish. But um, the, the species that are up in people's yards, along roadside ditches, uh, on, in stream banks, those are what we call uh, primary burrowers or just burrowing crayfish. And th those are the ones that are creating those structures uh, we call chimneys. And the chimneys are a direct result of their burrowing activity. And the burrowing species are extremely interesting. We're going to see some pictures of them. One of the things that makes them kind of fantastic is that uh, for some odd reason, they're, many of them are very brightly colored and absolutely fantastic animals to, uh, to see. But they are very, they're, they're similar but different than the crayfishes that we, that we find in streams and rivers. And those would be what we call secondary or tertiary burrowing crayfish. And those species will create a burrow but the burrow is not anywhere near as extravagant as those terrestrial species uh, that we were referring to as the primary burrow. And their burrows are usually um, basically underneath a rock uh, or some kind of log or something on the substrate. Uh, and the species that do that, it's just a weak depression. So uh, there's another group that like to live in streams that will dry up. So many of you uh, may have a stream in your backyard that this time of year during the winter and spring is uh, full of water. And then when July, August, September come by, it's completely dry. Well, the crayfish that live there will actually follow that groundwater down um, underground. And when they do that, they're creating that burrow network. And here again, they're absolutely one of the most important animals in those ecosystems because they're providing things like salamanders um, access to that water. So if you, you know, have a stream in your yard that dries up and you have salamanders there in the fall and the spring and it dries up every summer and you're kind of wondering like, how do they stay here? The crayfish are absolutely uh, critical for that process and that ecosystem function. It's, wait, okay, I've never heard this before. So do like an ephemeral stream that's only around seasonally will have crayfish that mm -hmm. live underground when the surface water dries up and the crayfish are creating habitat for salamanders and I guess other organisms too. Yeah. Uh, to date, uh, th there was a paper that came out in the late 80s that demonstrated over 300 species utilize those burrows. And if you actually were to identify the invertebrates that are utilizing those burrows, which really not, hasn't been done to date, down to the species level, it probably ends up being thousands of taxa. And, and that's what makes them so important, because if we lose them, we lose that ecosystem function. And then those salamanders, when your stream dries up the next time, they're going to die. So uh, the the we call those secondary burrowing crayfish. Those animals are absolutely 100% one of the most important animals in that particular ecological system. Now, when I think about crayfish, uh, I'm used to seeing, like I grew up in Middle Tennessee, for example, and you know, went looking for crayfish in parks around Middle and Eastern Tennessee. And you know, the crayfish were always, oh, you know, three, four, five inches long, all most of the time kind of browns or grays, drab colorations. Uh, is that pretty much what crayfish are like everywhere? Um, not exactly. I mean, we're kind of jumping ahead, but I can share my screen. I mean, this is a species that I described that lives in the mountains of uh, West, West Virginia. Hold on one second. And you know, it is far from, um, I mean, it's, it's one of the most brilliantly colored animals that we have here in my, in oh, the wow. state. So pretty awesome uh, beastie. And this is one of those burrowing crayfish, people that go up into our mountains and go to places like um, Seneca Rocks, uh, Dolly Sods, Canaan Valley, the Cranberry Wilderness. Um, this animal's actually quite common up there. Uh, so they're not all just this drab brown color. Uh, and, and several species, 
will be various shades of bright green, blue, red, orange, white, you know, all of the above. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, you know, as soon as I saw that, it made me think of um, like tweets or stuff that I see that pop up every now and then that say that uh, there's no like natural blue mm -hmm. in the, in the animal kingdom or in the wild in nature. And like, oh my gosh, that thing is an absolute gem mm -hmm. hanging out right, right here in the U.S. Crayfish have the market on blue. I will say that. There's at least nine taxa in the United States that are, are blue. Just in West Virginia alone, we have four different species of crayfish that are blue. There you go. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's really cool. So uh, we had titled the topic for tonight, Cryptic Crayfish. So let's get into that a little bit. What is a cryptic crayfish? I assume it means not just hiding in a burrow. Yeah, no, when we're talking about, when we're using the term cryptic with crayfishes, we're actually referring to a term in um, biology, which is cryptic species. And uh, cryptic species are species that oftentimes go unnoticed. A very literal definition of a cryptic species would be a species that can only be differentiated from another species through the use of DNA, um, through the science we call molecular phylogenetics. But in the case of crayfishes, we're using the term cryptic crayfish uh, because many of these species have been known for an incredibly long period of time by the local community, the populace, that blue species being a great example of this. But because there's so few crayfish biologists that, have, that can actually go out and do the technical process of describing a new, new taxa, these species oftentimes get lumped with another animal that they're actually different from. So we end up going out and make an assumption that, you know, this species of crayfish that we're gonna find has already been named. And when we get out and actually start doing the sampling, it might look like the species that was named, but in reality, we end up finding out that it's an undescribed species. And then we have to start this process of um, a species description. So, Cryptic crayfish is discovering new species of crayfish. It's expanding the, the biodiversity by, <laughs> it sounds like by leaps and bounds. Like, like if you're getting out there and uh, the, I'm, I'm guessing this is things like DNA evidence, mm -hmm. uh, genetics, and maybe what they look like, morphology, body shape, size, stuff like that. So you pull all that together uh, how many species of crayfish do you think could be out there that we just don't know about yet? Like, do you think you've got most of them? No, <laughs> that, that's a very blunt, <laughs> straightforward answer. No, there are absolutely uh, quite a few species uh, that are worthy of description. And the North Carolina you know, State Museum and Dr. Williams's lab, and along with my students, your uh, various people that work for your Department of Wildlife, you know, we're all working diligently just on the state of North Carolina. Uh, and when you expand out into other states, um, there may be as many as, you know, in a very liberal sense, there could be 20 to 30 new species in some states like Tennessee, or it could be, depending on your species definition, as few as, you know, eight to 10. And that's the other thing that a lot of people don't understand when you're describing new species is that when you're in school, uh, high school, college, outside of the world of organismal biology, you're, you're given one definition of a species and it seems to be a very straightforward black white answer. And those of us who are in the science of describing species realize that uh, defining a species, and we're not gonna get into this now because this will add an hour to this talk, but just throwing it out there for people <laughs> might be interested. Um, yeah, that alone is an incredibly uh, movable target. So when we go about uh, describing a new taxa, we use something called an integrated approach, which basically means that we utilize multiple lines of evidence when we're describing a new species. So I like to, to have um, morphology because I'm an old school naturalist. So I wanna be able to pick something up in, from the stream and then look at it and say, oh, that has this tubercle or this is that color on the claw. Uh, have what we would call a diagnosable character or key character. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, but we also have to have genetic evidence. And that's kind of the most technical aspect of this to kind of demonstrate that this 
organism represents its own lineage evolutionarily, and it's independent of other lineages. And then that morphology that's associated with that genetic lineage, that has to be allied with a specific geography. So it has to have a, a distribution that makes sense. So when we kind of glump all that together, we're utilizing something called an integrated species uh, definition. And we also have multiple lines of evidence pointing towards the same conclusion. And, and when you have that, then, you, then we can pull the trigger and say, yes, indeed, this is a new species. To me, it seems like it would be really exciting. Like there, like there must be a moment when you see the data from all these different lines of inquiry, it's all come together and you say, this is a, a new species. This is a different species of crayfish. It doesn't have a name or anything like that. It, what's that actually, feel? what's it like to discover a new species? It, it's pretty incredible, but it's also exhausting <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Animal okay. Planet, National Geographic, and you know the Discovery Channel, they kind of portray this as uh, you, you have your biologists wearing khakis because they're always wearing khakis and their jungle hat and they're you know, walking through the jungle and they just kind of stumble upon a sunbeam hitting a, a frog or a snake or a you know bird. And then they have this kind of ah eureka moment and you know in that instance, that's a new species. And I can flat out tell that's you- That's not how it happens? That's not how it happens. That has happened once. Oh, man. So for me. Um, most of the time, because you have to get the genetic evidence and then you have to compare it to the, uh, what we call the nominant species, which is the species that's named because you're splitting it away from that. You know, that involves having representative samples from all over the distribution of, of the animal in question. So as an example, um, this is a crayfish that is called uh, the Conaway crayfish. And this animal, is native to the New River in West Virginia and Virginia. And it was thought to be a species of crayfish that uh, the first specimen was described from the Scioto River in uh, Dublin, Ohio. So in the middle of Ohio. And if you know much about you know, geography, Ohio is not in Appalachia and this animal is in Appalachia. So a lot of people thought that this species that the animal that was in Ohio and the animal that was present in the New River in North Carolina and Virginia were the same species because they shared, if you can see my cursor, you know, this little rostrum part, the plate between the eyeballs. Um, and so uh, a colleague of mine did some genetics and he clearly demonstrated that the populations in Ohio were genetically distinct from the populations in the New River. So that was our kind of tip off that, hey, this might be different. So. Uh, we went and got, or I went and got all the specimens I could from museums, and museums are absolutely beyond important for the description of new, new species, because that's why we have all these specimens, is so that we have this uh, biological library to go to. And so I did a lot of measurements after someone had done the genetics of animals from, the Ohio, from Ohio and actually parts of Kentucky and West Virginia. I did the measurements for the animals in the New River in West Virginia and Virginia, and then we used some statistics that showed that, these anim that the animals in the New River were different from Ohio. So we had our multiple lines of evidence, the genetics, the morphology, the geography, and we, we then pulled the trigger and said, that's a new species. But that process took about four months. So it, it was not a eureka moment. Now with this wonderful animal, uh, this was the, the species where uh, I came the closest and Dr. Williams and I worked together on this crayfish, this crayfish has a wonderful common name. It's called um, the hillbear, hillbilly hairy crayfish, because you can see all these seedy, <laughs> that's what those are called. And these, this is a dwarf species of crayfish. It only gets to be about an inch, inch long in total body length. And these little guys are like little tanks. They run and bulldoze their way through cobble. Um, and it took oh, wow. Dr. Williams and I a little while to figure out how to catch them. Um, because if you think about it, if you can live anywhere in the cobble, you can live anywhere in the stream bed. So it wasn't just flipping big rocks. But once we figured that out, we went and collected this little guy and we had a concept of what it was supposed to be. And it definitely wasn't what it was supposed to be. And then so we went out and we expanded our range and we looked at other animals. This animal is endemic to um, Tennessee. So we were in this part of Tennessee called the Highland Rim. 
and uh, we found what it was supposed to be. And standing on the creek bank, holding them in hand, you could tell that they were different from each other. But we still had to do the whole big process to ultimately come to a conclusion. Um, many times when you're describing species, so we're back to the blue guy, uh, people will look at something like color. And up until this year, uh, we as crayfish biologists weren't allowed to use color. It wasn't like there's a rule book that says you can or can't. There was some um, scientists early on in astecology made a kind of a call that color is very, it, it's variable. And thanks to genetics, we now know that color actually is a little bit more telling when it comes to whether an animal is a new species or, or related than we had previously thought. Um, and so and here in West Virginia, as an example, we have a species of blue crayfish that lives here where I'm at. It's actually on my campus, not that far from where I'm sitting. And then we have a mountain range uh, called the Allegheny Mountains. And then when you get up at high elevation, there's another blue crayfish. But in that in between the low elevation and the high elevation, there's another species of crayfish that's orange that kind of it divides up this distribution. So uh, that same individual that did the genetics for the uh, that first species, he did the genetics for this animal, and it showed that these lowland blue populations were, they were very different genetically than the animals that were up at high elevation. And, and one thing I want to point out is, you know, people have been talking about the blue crayfish in the mountains of West Virginia for literally decades. Uh, I don't really like the word new species so much, because people have known about this animal forever. We, as scientists, really like to use the word undescribed species. And I can tell you, anytime that my research group describes uh, a, a species and you know people start using the word new, it gets spread throughout social media. And oftentimes people mm -hmm. say, that's not new. We've known about that for years. And I, I agree with them. It's just, it wasn't known to be new to science. So, you know, semantics kind of matter here. Uh, but Makes the sense. Process, yeah. in the end, it's kind of weird because uh, oftentimes it's a little bit anticlimactic. Like, you know, because it's just, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, but it is, we usually have a moment after the paper's published, usually, you know, two weeks to a month later, when you kind of have time to decompress, and, and that's when it kind of hits you, you know, wow, you just described a new form of life, and then that, and I will say as a biologist and a zoologist, it does not get any better than that, because these animals can't be conserved until they're recognized, so the very first part of the process for conservation is taxonomy. And a lot of times there's this disconnect where people think that people doing taxonomy and systematics aren't necessarily the conservation biologist. And I will flat out tell you, I'm both. Um, and when we get these animals names, oftentimes they, we're, we're splitting them off of a much larger uh, distribution. And then we end up finding out that they really are, you know, they have this in crayfish, small distribution and that means that they probably should receive some kind of protection. So, so that's interesting then, and maybe we'll skip ahead a little bit and talk about conservation then. Because sure. if, if, you're, right, if you're identifying uh, these undescribed species, it seems that like the, the uh, blue species you were just talking about, right? That, okay, so now it's its own thing, but it only lives in this small, limited environment. It's uh, that's I would guess that's probably part of the reason why it is its own species. You know the separation and all that through evolutionary time. So it would seem like it would be very important then to get measures in place if you don't want that species to disappear because now it could even more easily vanish. Yeah, exactly, and that's. That's why taxonomy matters in, in this case. I'll, I'll, you know, unfortunately, oftentimes systematics in, in, in taxonomy is well, we, it's underfunded. Um, now I can flat out say a, a plug to the North Carolina, you know, a biologist in, in your department of conservation. They get it, and they've absolutely funded work. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania has funded work for me. Um, West Virginia has, and we have to first recognize that diversity and, and get it named. Um, and what's What's nice is in the, in the process of describing a taxa, you, you have to do some uh, parts to the puzzle of doing conservation. So one of the most important things is just simply figuring out where the animal lives 
and figuring out what the density of those populations are through biological surveys. And, and that's the bread and butter of my laboratory. Uh, I have driven a university van down many a dirt road across all of Appalachia, the Ozarks, Eastern Texas, um, in search of these animals. And the ultimate you know, product of all that effort is we end up fleshing out these distributions. And oftentimes when we go and collect the crayfish, a lot of people wonder like, how do you go about doing that? Uh, do you just go to a site mm -hmm. and flip rocks? And it really depends on the project. But if we're doing this in a conservation minded way, we put forth the same level of effort at each site. And so that's a way that you can basically get the data back and it lets you know the density of the animals. So you can do as close to an apples to apples comparison of one river to another and uh, you know, figure out what your densities are. But you always do multiple sites and, and you know, that's a whole bunch of statistics. And uh, I don't wanna talk about that tonight. I wanna talk about crayfish. So, <laughs> um, you know, but, but that's the process. Uh, in a nutshell. And my lab's been involved with uh, a, a tremendous amount of, of that work. Um, one species that we've done a lot of work with is this guy right here. This is the Guyandot River crayfish. Um, uh, its Latin name is Canberra's veteranus. And sometimes when I'm giving presentations, I slip and just call it veteranus because that's what most of the biologists refer to it as. But this is an animal that was found in the Guyandot River of West Virginia, um, which is a small watershed. Uh, and it, it was discovered in 1900. And at that point in time, um, the Gondot River crayfish was found at several sites. And then as energy development occurred, then various extractive indices, industries occurred and uh, development actually occurred in, in the region. Many of the, the watersheds, rivers and streams became highly sedimented and basically biologically in some cases inert, like basic, it, it was mass carnage of the watershed. And as a result of that, this animal was actually at one time in the early 2000s thought to be extinct in West Virginia. Um, my lab oh, wow. did some work in 2009 and we actually found it at one stream, a stream called Pinnacle Creek. And so that let people know it was there. Um, and we, we did a lot of surveys after that and we basically ended up finding out that this animal was on uh, quite literally the brink of extinction and today we only have it in two streams so we're actively trying to just flesh out the biology because this animal's been put on the endangered species list but when you put an animal on the endangered species list the goal is to get it off the list you don't want it to stay on there and the problem with these crayfishes is a lot of people assume we know everything about a crayfish it's just a crayfish it couldn't be that complicated and in reality, these guys have an, a, a biology that in, in many regards makes them almost equivalent to small vertebrates. And they have a e ecological complexity that makes it so they don't just live under rocks. You know, they make mass movements. They need multiple habitats for their life history. And we didn't know that until the animal got listed. So the conservation process oftentimes involves just applied natural history before we can get into the kind of active conservation of rearing them in human care, restoring streams, and then putting those animals that we rear in human care back into the river. So um, yeah, spent a lot of time working on this animal. And every bit of work I do with crayfish ultimately is going to help conserve them because knowledge is power and we lack the knowledge for many of these animals. Um, there's a species of crayfish, uh, I, unfortunately I don't know its common name, um, it's called Canberra spicatus. And this is one that uh, I've worked with Dr. Williams on quite a bit and the students and I have, have worked with it. And it lives in South Carolina. And for the longest time, we just didn't know its distribution. And we didn't know if it was gone or not. We didn't know what its status was. So in the process of going out and trying to find Canberra spicatus, we stumbled on a handful of species that we now know need to be described. So it, when we go out and do this work, it's never just looking at one thing. It's, it, you have to have many irons in the fire going all at once when you're out in the field. And I like living my life that way. Um, I'm very bad at doing one thing. I've got a little bit of biological ADD. And, you know, I, I consider that one of my strengths, actually. But, you know, it, this is just fun. And it's, you know, it's fun to geek out and do conservation at the same time. So there you go. That's that's the game right there. That's the whole game. 
So uh, looking at the clock, I want to get to audience Q&A. I had so many more questions that I wanted to get to, but this one's important. And I see folks in the chat are talking about it too. How do we protect crayfish? The, the number one threat to stream crayfish throughout the southeastern United States, it, it doesn't matter if you're, in Apple, if you're in Appalachia, if you're down near the ocean, if you're in the Piedmont, uh, where, you know, where Raleigh is, is uh, doing land use practices that limit or halt sedimentation. So I have a picture of me here. Uh, it was to illustrate one point, but we're gonna illustrate another one. So here I am and this Hello. Uh-oh. I think uh, there went Zach. <laughs> uh oh okay so in the meantime i'm going to remind everybody while we give zach a chance to jump back into the zoom call uh you've got access to the chat go ahead type up your questions there i see there are some great questions coming in from lots of different folks thanks for joining us erla dan and I think there's a handful of crayfish biologists hanging out in the chat right now too. Like Dan Meyer, who's saying that the, <laughs> that was a classic Zach move. Was it? Should we should we should we rib Zach about this one? No? Get okay, we won't thing. do that. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm here. Sorry, there's a lot of things happening on this side. Um Okay, want me to go work, we're, pick up we're, where I left We're doing off? a live science show. We're doing a live science show between Raleigh, North Carolina and Northern West Virginia uh, in a pandemic, so. Yeah, and you won trivia, so you're totally good. I, yeah, I'm still in the hall of the claw or whatever that is. So yeah, here exactly. I am. <laughs> All right, can you see that? Yes? Yes. All right, so if you, Look in, and you know, here I am digging a burrowing crayfish, and this was to illustrate that point. But if you look at that water, um, notice how it looks like chocolate milk. Uh, you're looking at the number one threat to crayfish, and that's sedimentation. So, uh, all that fine sediment that's in suspension in that water, it is ultimately going to fall out of suspension and fill all the little rock spaces in the stream bed. And that is horrible for the crayfish that live down there because they now have to spend a tremendous amount of time pushing that sediment out. And as they're pushing that sediment out, they're using up energy, they're getting weak. Uh, they're also <clears throat> can potentially get smothered by the sediment. So you know, our land use and our watersheds is what's gonna lead to that. So if you end up cutting down all the trees or you put in a whole bunch of hard surfaces that leads to water when it rains, um, not necessarily being absorbed by the earth, but running off of that into the you know, local field and picking up loose sediment and then depositing it on the river, that's what's going to, in the end, harm the crayfish the most. So protecting our watersheds and, and keeping that sediment out of the stream, super important. If there's one thing above all others, it's sediment management when it comes to crayfish. So pay attention to what, what's going on in your yard, your neighbor's yard, yes. and development around you. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that's important, I guess, uh, is use, when you use crayfish as bait, um, a lot of times when, when people get done fishing with crayfish, they have two or three left over and they feel bad for them and they'll kind of dump them into the local watershed. And in reality, that is the absolute worst thing anybody can do. Uh, the best thing you can do if you're a fisherman is if you're, you want to use crayfish as your bait, get the crayfish from the stream you're fishing in. And I don't know the bait regulations for North Carolina off the top of my head, but also look into those uh, because in certain parts of the country, invasives are a major issue. And I know uh, Dr. Williams has been working in the coastal plain in North Carolina uh, and there's a crayfish there called the red swamp crayfish. That was the animal that I actually was eating in that one picture. And those animals are raised in aquaculture. And the crazy thing about that species is when it rains a lot and it's real humid and wet in May or June, they'll go on a little voyage of discovery and just say, see ya, and walk out of the pond and just travel across the landscape. 
and this first water body that they hit, they're going to colonize. And they are a very aggressive species. They'll actually engage native crayfish and kill them just to kill them. Uh, they'll breed with native species. Okay. Yeah, it's Gracious. not good. So you end up with a, what we call a monotypic crayfish population. And where there was a lot of biodiversity, you end up having one species. So uh, being aware of your practices with crayfish as bait is, is really, really important. There you go, folks. Good stuff to know. All right. I'm going to turn it over to the audience now. So uh, buckle up. I'm buckled. The first, <laughs> the first question that came in, uh, Erla made note that spiders often focus toxins in their system as predators, causing problems for birds that feed on spiders. Do crayfish do anything similar to that? What uh, are crayfish uh, anti-predator strategies? So to my knowledge, there's, there's nothing like the model for what spiders are doing or what poison arrow frogs do when they're feeding on ants and they take in the formic acid and become toxic. Uh, what crayfish have those pinchers, the keely, that is their, or claws, that's their number one defense. And then the other thing they do to deal with, with um, predators is they just try to avoid them. They'll swim away. Uh, that's actually why crayfish swim backwards. A lot of people wonder about that because as they're swimming backwards, they're able to engage uh, the predator that's trying to feed on them. But one thing that crayfish do, and you can see the anti-predatory behavior, uh, I always call it the hey, hey, hey stance off of Finding Nemo with the, uh, the dolls. But what um, crayfish do, when you pick them up, they'll take their claws and they kind of go, they, they spread out like this. And many times when a fish is trying to engage a crayfish, they'll spread their claws out like that. And that's them showing that potential predator, like I've got these weapons uh, that can do some damage, don't mess with me, and I'm this big. So with predators, there's this thing we call gape limitation. And you want to basically show the predator, I'm more than a mouthful. And so when they do that behavior, that's exactly why they're doing it. Um, and some crayfish pinch harder than others. I will say that. Uh, the burrowing yeah, that was going to be my next question. Yes. The, the burrowing species have to deal with a completely different type of predator than a fish. They're dealing with things like raccoons and possums, uh, mammals. So their keely evolved to deliver pain. And when you get pinched one, with one, uh, that's what they do. Um, I've been pinched by some burrowers where they've gotten their their uh, claw between my nail and um, the kind of skin that meets up with the nail. And when they push down on there, it kind of feels like you're just getting hit repeatedly with a tack hammer in your finger. It's it's not pleasant. Oh wow! Yikes! Yeah. Well, just sweet little crayfish mm -hmm. taking taking <laughs> you to town. Yep. I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh at that. Oh, no, it's okay. I mean, when the field is <laughs> real, we laugh at each other when we're getting pinched. It's it's part of the process. So. Part of it. All right, let's see here. Zachary Dillard wants to know, which came first, the chicken or the egg, or the crayfish or the lobster? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the marine form of a crawdad uh, came first. So... The modern day lobsters actually evolved later, but we'll go with that for the sake of simplicity. So um, the, the crayfish came from a marine existence. And this is something that I always bring up because as a crayfish biologist, you know, you get a little bit testy when the lobsters get all the cred uh, with their size and their fame, if you will. But in reality, uh, this body plan that crayfishes have and share with lobsters, it's far more suited for freshwater and a, a terrestrial existence than it is for a marine existence. And the way that we know that is the um, clawed lobsters, the true lobsters, there's less than a dozen species of those. And with crayfishes, we've got well over 600 species across the world. So if you use biodiversity as a metric, um, I like to say that uh, lobsters look like crayfish, not that crayfish look like lobsters. So there you go. There you go. I think you just settled the debate for Zachary. Okay, uh, some questions have come in about colors. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll throw both of them at you here. Uh, one, have you ever shined ultraviolet light on crayfish to see if they glow in the UV? I think the, the bright blue one 
got Erla thinking about uh, fluorescent animals there. Uh, and Troy is asking if the color of the crayfish has any significance. We can do the UV question first. And the answer to that is yes, we have. Uh, one of my students bought a UV light to look for scorpions. And it was just sitting on the table one day and I picked it up and two of the graduate students and I turned off the lights in the lab and we just started shining it on the crayfish. And we were kind of blown away that they fluoresced the way that they did. And, you know, me being the scientist, I thought first, how has no one done this? And the short answer <laughs> to that is I'm sure people have done it, but uh, I don't know of any crayfish biologists that have done it. And then the second was like, we got to write this paper now, um, you know, because the, what was really interesting is there's another group of cr crustaceans that are kind of distantly related to crayfish called mantis shrimp. And the mantis shrimp have long been known to that they can see the UV spectrum and they, they look completely different to each other that, uh, than uh, they look like to us. So I immediately thought about those and the patterns and the parts of the crayfish that were fluorescing made a whole lot of sense for signaling and talking to each other through color. And so my students and I got all excited and then we took that light to the field. And when we started shining it on the crayfish in the field, crayfish uh, will have biofilms that basically coat their bodies. And it turns out that all the algae and the, the paraphyton and the various things that grow on a crayfish, because crayfish is an ecosystem itself, um, completely muted the colors out, out. So I don't know what the ultimate role of those are. I'm not going to say oh, that it just doesn't serve a role, but it kind of showed what was happening out in nature because pretty much everything we've shined on, shined that light on had some kind of effect there. So they do, ref, do, they do fluoresce, not all of them, but some of them, but the ultimate role of that, we don't know. Um, the colors, we don't know what the colors really do for these animals beyond uh, serving as a form of camouflage for them. Um, what is interesting is many, many biologists uh, have kind of made theories as to why are these burrowing crayfish so bright. Um, and the two colors that show up the most are blue and uh, an orange red. And it turns out at nighttime, these animals are active at the mouth of their burrow. Uh, if, if you have crayfish burrows in your yard, I strongly encourage you in the spring or summer, if it's above 60 degrees outside, kind of creep around your backyard with a light on. You know, this is, doesn't sound sketchy at all, by the way, but you know, do that. Make sure you don't <laughs> go into your neighbor's yard or something like that and <laughs> right. kind of light at those holes. And you'll see the crayfish oftentimes sitting up there. This is what they look like. This is crayfish biologist imitating that. Um, and interestingly, the part of their bodies that's exposed to the environment is often red or blue and red and blue are really good at absorbing white light. So it could be a form of nocturnal camouflage. Uh, we're thinking about these colors during the day, uh, but if you think about them at night, like deep sea fishes are all red and that's an adaptation because they don't want to reflect any kind of light because they reflect the slightest bit, they're going to shine like a light bulb to a predator. So that's my hypothesis and theory, but in the end, we don't really know. Um, and, and that's something that there's a couple biologists right now that are investigating and kind of digging into. Very interesting stuff. All right. Okay, moving along. There's a lot of questions here. This is awesome. I love nights where there's lots of questions. Um, can they communicate with each other? If so, how do they do that? This is my favorite thing about crayfish. Um, and Good I get to talk Zachary. about, uh, well, well, we'll just dive into it. So crayfishes have two sets of antennae when you look at them. Um, in fact, I'll bring up a picture uh, of this. Hold on one second. The big and- so They've got the big ones. Yeah, those are what we call antenna. Um, and, and their main purpose is to, I don't want to hit the wrong button. Did I hit the wrong button? I'm now terrified to hit the wrong button. All right, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay, got the right thing. I up still there. have you. Okay, so if you look at this picture of a crayfish, we have those two long antennae that are streaming back along the body of the animal. Those uh, are used to smell things. They kind of move those out in front of their bodies to taste their environment. They're tasting everything. They actually have taste buds on their feet. So everything they touch with their feet, they're tasting, their claws, they're tasting. But what I want everybody to look at are 
the four little antennae, we actually call those antennules, they're sticking right out of the face of the crayfish. It kind of looks like a, a weird mustache. Those are incredibly important for crayfishes for communication. And so the way that crayfish communicate is through chemistry. They don't really care what each other looks like. They basically pick up hormones from each other. And if they're stressed, there's more testosterone there or cortisol, those are their stress hormones. Um, if a boy crayfish wants to figure out if it's a girl, he's gonna pick up on estrogens. If a female wants to figure out if it's a male, she's gonna pick up on testosterone. But the million dollar question is like, how, where do the hormones come from? And this is, this aspect of crayfish biology is what made me settle on crayfish. So the way they communicate is crayfish have two little holes in their face. And the technical term for them is nephritopore. Uh, it's basically what they pee out of. So first, how awesome is okay. it that crayfish pee out of their face? I mean, that's pretty incredible. There you but go. what's even better is they use pee to talk to each other. So crayfish even one better. walks up to crayfish two, they both pee into each other's faces and then they start wibbling and wobbling those antennules around and they're gonna pick up estrogen and testosterone and cortisol, these hormones. And then that's what's gonna tell them what they need to know about this crayfish. And then oftentimes what ends up happening if it's two boys, about a second or two later, they're fighting. If it's a male and a female, you know, they're gonna, they might try to mate. Uh, the girls are, uh, the females are, are much more civil in crayfish society. So they just basically say, hey, how's it going and go about their merry way. Um, but no, that's how they do their communication is through chemical communication through pee. And, you know, bike drop, best animals in the world at this point. I, uh, I say it all the time. The regular viewers of the show will know I say it all the time. Nature is wild, y'all. Mm -hmm. That is, that's quite a story. Okay, I'm looking at the clock. We've got some more questions here. I want to make sure that I get to. Uh, Jessica is saying, I grew up in Southwest Virginia, Lee County, and played in the creeks and rivers nonstop. Crawdads were at my absolute favorite. Has any research or discoveries occurred in that part of Virginia that you know of? Yes. Uh, Would Jessica have met some undescribed species? Absolutely. Um, right now, I know of at least one in the Clinch River that is worthy of description. And here again, you know, it's, it's good to say undescribed species because I know Jessica would have found it because it's actually the most common crayfish in that, that part of the world. So there you go. Uh, yes, indeed. And then we we're working on another crayfish uh, complex that we know of at least two additional species that are undescribed in that part of Virginia. All right, Rachel Scott is asking a question and I know the answer to it, but it was one that I wanted to ask you too. Uh, and it's a good one as we get close to the end of our time here. Are there any crawdads named after you? Uh, yes, there are. Um, I can actually show a picture of that one. Uh, so one of the things that's kind of fun about crayfish biology is I described my first species in 2009. We submitted the paper and I, I believe it was published in 2010. And at that point in time, I thought, yes, this is great. This is fantastic. You know, I'm going to do this forever. And then what I ended up finding out was that it, it still is great and fantastic, but it takes a lot of time. And I was spending all my time describing crayfishes. So I got, I was asked to write a book on the crayfishes of West Virginia. And the problem was I needed to get some of these crayfishes names. So I put a crayfish up for, uh, you know, I, I presented to some of my students and said, hey, do you guys want to name a crayfish? For the mm -hmm. record, I didn't say, name this crayfish after me. I said, would you like to describe a species? Because I was working on two at the time. And so um, my students did do that. And I, I kind of helped from afar. But in the end, uh, they ended up describing this species. And it's another one of these blue guys. Um, and this is a uh, Canberras Loafmanai. So it's, its common name is the Taze River Mudbug. And it is endemic to uh, West Virginia. It lives around um, Charleston, between Charleston and Point Pleasant, where Mothman lives. So I did a lot of work in that part of the world, um, and, and I'm I'm quite happy that you know there's a crayfish down there scuttling around uh, 
that has my name with it. And, and I'm also extremely humbled. And, and this is the, the, the best thing professionally, you know, the best acknowledgement I've personally had. Uh, it means a lot, especially that my students were the ones who described it. It's a beautiful crayfish. Yeah, I'm rather partial to it. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous. Okay, let's see here. Uh, how big are the biggest crayfish? Ah, the biggest crayfish are huge. And I encourage everybody um, to, you know, stop looking at me for a minute. If you're on YouTube, open another tab and look up the Tasmanian um, giant. It should be called the giant crayfish, but unfortunately, that damn lobster term, sorry, that lobster term's in there. So it's the giant, the giant freshwater lobster. Um, it's Latin name's Astacoxus goldi. And it's the world's largest freshwater invertebrate. Um, they can weigh in excess of eight pounds. And from the tip of their rostrum, uh, which is that little thing that looks like a nose between their eyes to the tip of their abdomen, uh, they can be pushing 20 inches, even up to two feet. It's an absolutely <laughs> enormous thing. So that's a monster mud bug. Yes, absolutely. All right. There you go, Zachary. Uh, okay. What is the most frustrating crayfish species you've encountered? Were they actually catching it or finding only that species when trying to find something different? That is an amazing question. Um, there, there's been a handful. So, uh, Nothing against South Carolina, but I find doing field work uh, in the Piedmont of South Carolina from like Columbia to Greenville and that kind of rolly hill area. Um, that is just absolutely grueling to study crayfish in streams because many of the streams in that part of the world have sand as a substrate. And if you're a crayfish biologist, uh, you despise sand. Sand bottom streams, it takes a special kind of biologist to uh, sample sand bottom streams. And, and interestingly, the, the biologists that obviously work in South Carolina do an amazing job finding these animals that I can't because I'm up here in Appalachia where every stream has these wonderful things we call rocks. Uh, so anytime I have to do any kind of sampling where there isn't rocks, you know, it, it, it kind of gets a little bit grueling because uh, you're the crayfish live underneath undercut banks. So you're you're kicking underneath the banks and your nets get stuck in the roots and you can put holes in your waders. And when you're in the coastal plain, there's, um, now granted, I like snakes. So, you know, when I see a cottonmouth or a water moccasin, my day got better, but lots of people, you know, have a, a negative response when they see those, those animals. So you're kind of dealing with some interesting wildlife. And then oftentimes we go into the streams and bridges. And one of the things we've learned interestingly is that South Carolina has very large wasps and they really like South Carolina's bridges. So I've had many students, I've avoided this, but on you know one occasion I had one of my students go down and then we heard you know, various speaking of tongues and looked up and the kid was standing on the bridge in his underwear. And I thought, what, what is going on here? Well, he had gotten lit up by a spider wasp. So South Carolina, pretty much anything that has to do with crayfish collecting in that part of South Carolina, um, <laughs> that, that's it. No offense, South Carolina. No offense, South Carolina. <laughs> we'll, we'll take our crayfish biology somewhere else. Oh, all right. Um, Hank was asking about crayfish tubes. Hank, I think you could probably find photos of crayfish tubes with a really quick Google. Yeah, I actually don't know what that is. So... A crayfish. Uh, I think uh, I think I poorly described them earlier, but the when they build the burrows, chimneys. Oh, yes. Chimneys. Is what chimneys. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a byproduct of of the um, the burrowing process. And just so you know, uh, a lot of times people will have crayfish in their yards, and they'll say those are snake holes. And my response to that is, how does a snake dig a hole? Now, things like northern pine snakes and eastern hognose snakes can dig. Uh, but they're not digging a well-defined tunnel uh, in the earth. Those are almost always created by either rodents, or crayfish burrows, sorry, crayfish. And if it's a crayfish burrow, you can tell by looking at it most of the time because a rodent burrow will, will go down into the earth about an inch or two, and then it'll start running just underneath the surface. Whereas crayfish burrows usually go straight down for anywhere for, from a foot to as much as like six, eight feet. They can be very, very deep. 
Oh, wow. Impressive. Impressive stuff. Well, I'm going to call time on it because we're, we're well over our eight o'clock time now. We've gone over an hour. Uh, Zach, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a blast. I really enjoyed it. That was a wealth of incredible crayfish knowledge. Everybody watching knows more about crayfish now, except for the handful of other crayfish biologists, people who I know are watching the program. <laughs> Maybe they know more, but everybody else uh, has been totally enlightened to the wonderful world of the crawdads now. So, so thank you so much. Um, if folks wanted to learn more about crayfish or the work that your lab is, is up to, at West Liberty. Is there a way for them to do that? Uh, yes, there is. Um, my lab has a Facebook page. Um, if you search Loafman Lab and then WLU Crayfish Conservation Lab, many of the, in fact, all of the photographs you saw tonight are, were on that website. Um, and we go to great lengths to kind of keep it as current as possible. So um, yeah. And when we're in country, you know, sampling, we oftentimes will put a post up that night so you can kind of keep tabs on where we're at and what we're doing. Great stuff. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Science Tonight. I hope that I'll see you again next week, Thursday, seven o'clock, right here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences YouTube channel. You can click the button below to subscribe, to click the bell to get notified when we're going live with the next edition of the show or any of the other great virtual programs that we offer out of the museum. You can also follow the museum on social media, of course. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all three of them as at Natural Sciences. And if you're curious, next Thursday, we're gonna be talking to Dr. Kelly Spear. Dr. Spear studies parasites and is a postdoctoral researcher at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. So or the National Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. So we're gonna be talking to Kelly about parasites and why they need conservation also, which you may not think they do, but apparently they do. So we're gonna learn about that. That's next Thursday, seven o'clock, right here on Science Tonight. Until then, take care everybody, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye everybody.